I am up here after our lunch with the distinct pleasure of introducing a tremendous um, newish friend of mine. It's been a couple of years. I always think I'd know somebody a few years. And, um, and I'm starting to really feel like I've got a tremendous friend in Johanna James because uh, she was a great ally to this concert, uh, conference when um, you know things got a little rocky and uh, really put a lot into it. But when I first met Johanna, <clears throat> I didn't really meet her. I got to know her as you can for people who are on the internet. We were in Egypt in 2020. It's one of the most fabulous Egypt trips of all time because it was deep COVID. They just opened the country back up as one of the first countries to open back up. So there were zero tourists. We took pictures that you'll never take again because there's nobody there. So we had a great trip. But when I got on the bus the first day, somebody was pointing, I was like, who's that, who's that? And he said, oh yeah, she's kind of kind of, kind of famous, you know? She's really a, a content creator and out there and got a bunch of followers and had a huge face, fa uh, Facebook fan base and all this. And I said, well, heck, before I talk to her, I, I gotta, gotta go look that stuff up. So I like furtively started looking at Johanna James. And then I got nervous. <laughs> I was like, this chick is really talented, you know? And what struck me, and I didn't know till we were just chatting a minute ago, when I told her this in Egypt, you know, I was like, oh, I hope that didn't offend her. But she struck me as a female Jim Carrey. <laughs> Has anybody else ever thought that about Johanna when you see her? You know what I mean? Whereas just God gave her a talent to communicate in so many different ways physically and gave her the beautiful voice. And he also gave her a beautiful brain. And she's gonna share with you, yeah, thank you. So we're gonna take a little trip fantastic, okay? We've provided the evidence, and we'll continue to provide the evidence that there can be catastrophes that can wipe out things that we can barely imagine, right? because there's not gonna be a whole lot of evidence yet, and certainly no one's looking for it if it were there. So Johanna's gonna give us a look at what she thinks it might've looked like, what it might've been like. Who were these uh, people in what I call, and I hope it catches on, because it's sometimes the precursor civilization, that which was before. And you know there was something back there. And it took me a while to get my brain around that, because I came from the science lane on this, but about 10 or 15 years ago, I started saying clearly, there was something before. So Johanna is gonna share with us what if there was that civilization and what it might have been. So a big round of applause for Mrs. Johanna James from London, England. All righty then. Uh, what if, okay, so, yeah, I met George on tour in Egypt in 2020. Uh, it was the pandemic. At the time, you were not allowed to leave England, so I like snuck out <laughs> past the border. And I, totally on my own, I spent all of my savings joining uh, this YouTuber called Ben, Uncharted X. I'd found him in the pandemic and I was just obsessed. I'd fallen down the rabbit hole and I was watching Rogan and Jimmy and Ben and I was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, Atlantis could be real. I'd heard of Atlantis, uh, but I'd only really heard of it in like the Disney sense or in that magical place with like flying cars and crystals and things. Uh, and then I heard about the Younger Dryas and it all started, like the pieces all started forming in front of me. I was like, I've gotta go, I've gotta go on the ground. I had no intention of putting out a YouTube or getting involved other than just to research what I wanted to research. I'd already been on, on the internet. I did uh, sketch comedy for like five years and that's how I made my living. And then I brought my camera with me to Egypt, did a little vlog. I made like nine vlogs actually, there's a lot of them. And they did really well. And with the help of Ben and the community, they like really embraced me and were like, yeah, new person, get involved. Um, we want the, the word out as much as possible. So that's how I got started. A little backtrack. So what if, what if, what can we see? Here we go. So I wanted to explore the story of Plato's Atlantis. And I wanted to see if we could, could we verify it? with anything outside of Plato, because the problem is, is that Atlantis named Atlantis, the, the island that disappeared in a day and a night, in a catastrophe, it's only technically found in Plato's work. It's really hard to corroborate it, like, literature-wise. So I thought, okay, let's have a look in the real world, see if we can verify anything. Um, and I'm 100% putting my tinfoil hat on for this one. I welcome you to do the same, because we've got some amazing, prestigious academics here. And I was like, I'll take the, the tinfoil hat. I'll do it. Because that's what, the, it's, what it's about. And over the last three years that I've been doing a YouTube channel, 
uh, it's got more and more like almost political, like the idea of pseudo-archaeology. Like that wasn't, I didn't really didn't know anything about that when I started. I just dived right in. And now I'm like, oh, this is tense. There's people on both sides. It's getting very hot. It's a hot topic. Um, but I don't, I don't mind. Like I'm, I joined this for the imagination. I enjoyed this because I, I really wanted to write a, a screenplay about the Younger Dryas Comet impact. I was like, oh, this is the stuff I want to see in movies. I want to, I want to see this one day up like Titanic was. That, was. that was kind of my dream and my goal to do this. So I'm more than happy to spread my imagination and just think like, what if, what if the story was based on something that was completely true and we hadn't really clicked on it until right now. Oh, I've got a slidey thing. There we go. That's how this works. There we go. Okay. Atlantis. Who's seen this movie? Yeah. It's an amazing piece. It's a cinematic masterpiece, in my opinion. But I think it came out 20 years too early. At the time, Disney was all into like, musicals and things. And this one just came out the door, and people didn't really know how to take it. And Michael J. Fox, by the way, playing the lead, legend. But it did a bit of a disservice to Atlantis in as much as it also advertised it because it really created this world where it was you know, magic and all the, the tech, high tech technology flying cars. So when I say, oh, I think Atlantis might be real, people are like, wait, what, the Disney thing? I'm like, no, no, like Plato's Atlantis. So I thought I would run through the basics, the 101, the Plato's, so we're all on the same page here of what I'm talking about, looking into Plato's text, because I reread it before I came. I reread uh, Timaeus and Critias, and I found some stuff in there that I didn't know was in there. And I was like, why are people not speaking about, about this? I've got, I've got to tell everyone at the summit. So, so we're all on the same page. Plato's Atlantis talks about this Atlantean civilization living both inside and outside the Mediterranean had uh, kings, cultures, stone buildings, agriculture, they were seafaring, they had a military. In fact, they didn't have one king, they had 10 separate kingdoms with 10 separate lists of rules and almost their own cultures themselves. A, a huge uh, history with, with gods and Poseidon, uh, like being the, the, the origin guy who, who kicked it all off. And it disappeared in a deluge. Oh, we've got some funky little text here, but th that was going to be 9,000 years <laughs> prior to 600 BC. We'll just, whatever. And the majority of sort of academics and people, you know, literature, um, they believe it was imagined entirely by Plato, and that is the argument that I've come up against by a lot of people saying, oh, no, he just clearly, purely just made the story up, off his brain, boom, boof, like invented the entire thing. But the more I look at it, and the more I like, look at things around Plato, I'm like, I find it very hard to believe that he actually did. So, I've also used AI, guys. I've, I've joined mid-journey. I had loads of fun. So AI is going to help me with my sort of storytelling journey here. So this is Plato, according to AI. He's a unit. <laughs> look at that. Great. So this is Plato, obviously, uh, writing his, his dialogues and he was a philosopher, and he, he wrote he, amazing work. And it was around 360 BC, so here we go. Now, the story goes is that Plato, he says that he didn't invent the story. In fact, he says many, many times, although this story is like completely crazy, or I am paraphrasing here, um, it's true, it's, it's totally true. I got it, I got it off my, my distant relative, Solon, it's like 300 years before me, he traveled to Egypt and he uh, spoke with the, like, the ancient priesthood um, in Sais. Am I making that? Is that me? I'll stay away from the mic. And I heard this story that blew my mind, and this story told that there was, there was a civilization that's older than the Greeks itself. And um, so this is Solon. <laughs> According to AI. And Solon traveled to the, the Temple of Sais, and um, he, he got and he downloaded all this information. Um, and he then told it to a distant relative of his. Um, oh, here we go, I wrote it down. So Solon, and I, I estimated a, the, the trip, the, it's a historically observed trip that Solon, the real dude in real life, really did go to Egypt after he'd, um, done what he did, uh, he retired and did like a kind of 10-year tour 
and he did go to Egypt around 590 BC. And then he told his distant relative, great granddad Dropides, probably about 10, 20 years later. And the great granddad Dropides relayed this story to granddaddy Critaeus, and then granddaddy Critaeus told Plato, and that's how Plato claims he knows the story. So it kind of goes through these four people. Um, and this is AI as well. This is a little Plato speaking to granddaddy Critaeus, um, learning the story. Uh, he hasn't got a hand. Oh, he's got three legs. Uh, yeah. Accurate. Accurate here. So one of the first things that you say when you say about Atlantis, you, tell, you say that, oh, well, you know, Plato got it from Solo. People go, oh, it's an oral story. It's an oral tradition. Like, you know, people can't remember that well. There's no way that people could have passed down that amount of knowledge um, accurately. Like, there's just no way. So, you know, you're trying to look for a needle in a haystack here. So, as I said, I read recently, I reread all of the, all of the text, and it says here, a little quote, if only he'd not taken up poetry merely as a hobby, I wish that he'd finished the story that he brought back from Egypt, because if he had, he would have become more famous as a poet than Hesiod, Homer, and all the rest. Obviously, Homer's Homer's Odyssey, he's the guy that wrote about Troy and published um, poetry in a similar fashion. So this was um, talking about, uh, Intermeus talking about Solon, saying that he had brought back a story and he was planning to publish it. And I was like, okay, well, if you're planning to publish it like, like Homer did, then surely there's like a manuscript in there. So I don't know why people always say it's purely an oral story. Uh, he must have written it down. And there are so much, many details in uh, Plato's dialogue that I think that, yeah, it is hard to believe that it's just an oral story. But this is giving me the hunch that he'd written it down. Uh, then I got to the next book and turns out he absolutely did. Look, Solon was planning to compose a poetic version of the tale. Uh, it is his written version, which once belonged to my grandfather and is now in my possession. I studied the manuscript carefully. So if you hear the Greek sounding names, now you know why. Uh, move on to a minute. But um, so there was, there was a physical manuscript that Solon had brought back. And this manuscript got passed on to uh, the, the distant relative. And that's how Plato ended up with it. So he was working not from just an oral story, but he had a physical like codex uh, in which to transfer the information. So when someone, it kind of completely evaporates the idea that we are basing all of this on oral stories and oral traditions, uh, because it was, it was written, he wrote it down. So um, tick one to credibility uh, on that. And if you uh, hear the Greek sounding names, now you know why. He was explaining that when Solon heard the story, obviously it was from the ancient Egyptian priesthood, and they had their own names for Atlantis. So the word Atlantis is the Greek name that Solon invented and added to it because he was tailoring his story to his audience, know your audience. And uh, that's why it's weird that there's like a Greek sounding names turning up in an ancient Egyptian cultural story. And that could also be one of the reasons why the, the world, the name Atlantis, doesn't turn up in any other text anywhere, because Solon invented the name. Because there are many, many stories that exist there of um, cultures that have civilizations that have disappeared. And even in Egypt itself, um, in Edfu, there's this like huge wall. It's quite fun trying to find it. It's like very deep in the temple. It's like a temple run, and you get there, and there's this whole temple wall that is dedicated to this ancient story. Um, and they talk about the origins of where the Egyptian culture comes from, and they do not claim themselves to have originated in Egypt. They say that they come uh, from an island, from an island of the gods, and that was destroyed in a deluge. It's a very, very similar story. It doesn't use the name. Atlantis, but why would it? Because Solon was the one that invented the name. Moving on. So ancient Sais. Again, if Plato was completely inventing the story out of his brain and was just making it up, he chose ancient Sais as the location that Solon went and got the information from. And um, I did a little research into ancient Sais. Turns out it's a super old place. There's Neolithic settlements there from at least 5000 BC. There is a medical school there and a woman's school at 3000 BC. One of the first female doctors came out of there. She's like famous because she like healed a pharaoh or something. But um, really cool stuff that I didn't know about. Um, it was like a certifiable wisdom keeping ancient place. It would be the very place that where you would keep 
and hold ancient lore and information and myths. And it's like, it's just very certifiable. Out of all the places in the world that you would invent so long to go, it's, it's very legit, almost university. And here it's quoted, but from long ago, every impressive or important or otherwise outstanding event we hear about, whether it happens in your part of the world or here or elsewhere, has been written down and preserved. And here's an AI uh, thing of scrolls just to show that they wrote it down. Uh, our documents record how your city once halted an enormous force that was marching against not just the whole world, no, not the whole world, the whole of Europe, uh, but Asia as well, from beyond its base in the Atlantic Ocean. I should mention that in those days, the ocean was navigable, as in you could sail around it, since there was an island in front of the strait, and travelers used it in those days to get to further islands from where they had access to the whole mainland on the other side. Um, in some translations, it's called the opposite continent. So they're talking about you leave the Strait of Gibraltar, which is the, the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea, and you can kind of island hop your way across the Atlantic. And it wasn't this massive, huge, one uh, pelting journey like it would be today, that there, there was a route there. And uh, this is, uh, <laughs> what I, when I read that, this is what I envision exactly, that you're gonna come out sailing with your little boat outside the Strait of Gibraltar, and you're gonna hit an island, and then there you can travel to further islands out when well, there are, there are Azores Islands in the middle. And then you move on to the opposite continent or like the entire mainland. And to me, that looks like America. Um, here's a better view. Oh, uh, hi, Randall. Uh, a better view of the high points of the ocean floor. Um, Randall gives evidence. I'm not going to attempt to go into the science that Randall can give on this, um, but there is evidence for the immersion and immersion of um, the Azores Plateau, because um, there is only tiny, weeny, weeny islands there today. But there, there is geological evidence that that this place in the world um, has been going up and down. So it is not completely impossible that there were more islands, bigger islands, because the sea was a lot lower, and the ocean floor is it, it's, it's kind of doing this. That's the technical scientific <laughs> term that <laughs> I'm bringing to this. Right, okay, so, so this is the only land that is above water today. Those tiny little red dots is the Azores Islands, which happen to be sitting right on top of a trifold of plates uh, and again, this is relevant. If, you're to, if Plato completely invented this out of his brain and was just like, hmm, where am I going to place this story? Should I put it in like this ocean, the Indian ocean? Like, where should I put it? No, he puts it bang right in the middle of the place in the Atlantic Ocean where it is like you do not want to be in like a catastrophic time in, in history. You've got the North, uh, the European and the African and the American plates all meet in this weird little weak spot that literally doesn't happen anywhere else, just right there, in the middle, near the Azores. And I was like, how, what is the probability of Plato just inventing a place that an island went down? And he got it on the money in terms of like geographical data, so I'm like, amazing. So the Azores as well, people are like, oh, where is Atlantis? And, and you know, is it here, is it over there? Well, I think it's, it's, it's a difficult, complex question because there was 10 kingdoms, and I personally think that it was a huge chunk of almost everywhere of that side of the planet. You've got people from Lower Spain, in, in the Strait, outside the Strait, North Africa, you know, down, like, let's not exclude um, Morocco, the rich out structure, and the Azores. All of it, in a sense, to me, could be the Atlantean Empire. But specifically in the Azores, it's just interesting how we don't even really get to look for it, where it is, Plato described where it was, because you're not allowed to look for it. So in the Azores' official history, it's completely uninhabited until 1424, when the Portuguese discovered it, and uh, literally they were like, oh, this is nobody's ever lived here ever again. Um, not true. <laughs> there is an ancient cut stone in the Azores, like seriously old, um, dolmens and, and, and cut stone that was not uh, part of the Portuguese. Um, they, they, there's like caves and burial sites and things that are very, very clearly man-made and very, very clearly ancient that are, that are still just hanging out in the mountains of the Azores to this day. They found 4,200-year-old um, ceramics 
just sort of lying around. There's also uh, this weird thing with Holin, which is an ancient sailing anchor that looks similar to ones used around 100 BC. So the idea that the Azores was uninhabited, like we, I confidently clear that off the table because this place uh, seriously was old and we, we almost have no idea of who was here and when. Um, and I'm really surprised that this stuff's sort of still staying there. There's even more. There's this uh, caves where you have these man-made uh, kind of holes in, and they, again, they're looking elsewhere. And in the Middle East, there's very similar things happening in um, the previous millennium. And they're like, yeah, this is super old. This is man-made, and it's all just chilling in the Azores, yet it's not officially allowed to exist. There's like uh, man-made water channels. Um, channeling water around the Azores, which is something Plato also spoke about, that, that humans would have the ability to build aqueducts and, and bits and bobs. You also find these weird track marks, which we, we see in Malta. Malta's kind of famous for them. Nobody really knows what they are, but they go for miles, and um, people are like, I don't know, maybe for carts and stuff, but we find them on the Azores. And I'm like, that's weird. So you've got it all the way in the middle of the Mediterranean. You've got You've got track marks on Malta, and then you have it all the way out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and they're like the same, and, and then yet the story of Plato said that the civilization was linking the inside of the Mediterranean with the out. I'm like, okay, well, you got that weirdly on the money. The Azores also naturally have the same rocks that were described in Plato's text. He, Plato talks about the island having um, red rock, black rock, white rock, and how pretty it was, because they made like, beautiful structures and houses out of all of the natural, pretty, pretty rocks that were available to them. The Azores have exactly that. Um, they also have hot and cold springs running out of them, which is, again, another feature that magically Plato invented. Um, and I'm thinking, how could, how could a Greek guy who wasn't so put, again, nobody went to Azores, right, before like, 1400, how could he know that there was islands in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that had hot and cold springs and black and red and white rock? It's starting to look a bit weird, right? The, there's evidence of ancient people living there. Um, there's evidence of ancient water systems, um, aqueducts. There's, there's aqueducts that are very definitely more like Roman as well, that are like rolling around the Azores. Um, and also in the Ice Age, it was a hot tropical climate, which is another tick to the verification of, of the story, the, the descriptor in the story. Um, completely stole this from, from Randall's slide, sorry. Um, the Ice Age, like the Gulf Stream was different back in, in the last Ice Age. It kind of whipped up in a different way than it does today, and it warms literally that center bit uh, in, in the Azores. So if you were picking somewhere in the Ice Age to like live and like build your civilization, I would go there because it's hot. Now, the sea mounts uh, are super interesting. I love, I have, well, my theory is that every ancient story, every ancient text, every ancient tale, I think it comes from a kernel of truth. Uh, as a story writer, and I, 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 write, um, I write stories and I write screenplays, and everything that I write comes from a place of something that I've seen or experienced or I've heard of someone else seeing or experiencing. It's very rare that somebody just makes something up out of their brain that they have no reference of some sort of truth to it. So this, I think, is a very good example of how the origin story of something like Atlantis or Poseidon could have occurred. You got these uh, huge sea mounts, these like ancient mountains that are now underwater um, it, near the Azor Plateau. And you can see from the left slide, they kind of look like flat-topped mountains. And on the right side, that's an image of what they could have looked like uh, when they were um, originally pointy. And um, we've got Poseidon, who's known for having this like three-pointed trident that comes out of the water. Um, thank you, AI, just like that. Um, and we're like, where could this have come from? OK, so back in the day when the, when the, the oceans were, were lower and the mountain was higher, the mountains would have peaked up out of the ocean. And if you were an ancient sailor and you've got the Atlantic Ocean and you're like, oh, which way do we go? I can imagine that you would head for like this three-pointed trident that's coming out of, of the ocean, uh, like uh, Poseidon's trident. And it would be a really good um, logical thing to navigate to. And it could be the origin source of, oh yeah, Poseidon, he's the one that, that um, built the island. I had a bit of trouble trying to get this image out of AI. It was harder than you think to just say, can I have some mountains coming out of the water, please? I was trying all these like prompts, like I want like a sort of three-pronged fork mountains thing, and it gave me that. Um, <laughs> But I was like, close enough, that'll do. 
great. And back to Timaeus. I should mention that in those days, the ocean was navigable since there was an island in front of the strait. And this is another thing that if Plato again completely made this up, he has yet again got it bang on the money. There was an island that was exactly in front of the strait in the time period that Plato is talking about, uh, 9,000 years before his time, when this story was uh, supposedly supposed to happen. Oops, we went a bit too far. There is an island that was called Spartal Island, and it sank 11,000 years ago with the rising of the sea level. Now, it's nowhere near as big as the description of what we get for Atlantis in Plato's text. Um, it's only like six and a half kilometers by 4,000 kilometers. And, but it's 130 meters down. And I read a, a paper saying that it is completely geologically uh, plausible that it was above water and that people may have used it um, in this time period. Um, there would need to be a tectonic plate subsidence of about 40 meters to make it all match up, but they again say that that's completely feasible and like there's nothing to say that it, it couldn't be. So, um, and uh, here's the paper, so you know I'm not lying. Um, <laughs> So I'm one. I'm like, wow, that's insane. So Plato wrote that there was an island. Like, I, again, what are the chances if I'm writing my imaginary screenplay about this imaginary island, and I'm putting it in a very specific time frame, and I say that there is an island there that just, and then there was. Like, how could he have known that? It's again tick to the side of starting to look a bit dodgy that he made it up. Another thing that um, comes out as like this magical, mystical uh, thing sometimes people use in, to, to, just, to say that Plato obviously was making up like a fairy tale was the use of this like rare, uh, crazy metal called, I mean, I don't know how to say it, we're gonna say auriculum, auriculum, however you wanna say it, go you. Uh, and that, which is now only a name, and was then something more than a name, was dug out of the earth in many parts of the island, being more precious in those days than anything except gold. The wall of the citadel flashed with the red light of a <laughs> Well, they found it. They found this metal. Um, it was in a, a sunken shipwreck. I think it was like 2017. Um, it was off the coast of Greece, and they, they found this uh, huge chunks of this really weird red gold, and they tested it, and it was this weird, um, it wasn't actually that like, amazing. It had sort of like copper and zinc and, and gold in. Um, but it, it, the area off Greece where it was found was known to be this ancient uh, metal workplace where they would make um, jewelry and, and really luxurious things. Um, and so again, something that Plato was referencing and including in his story is something that turns up very real in the real world, like the island and um, like the time frame uh, for, for when he's saying a deluge occurred. Yes, we've got science now saying that, yeah, it was a crazy time. And uh, if there was any time period in the world that an island was you know, gonna get whacked by, by a tsunami, it's probably gonna be in the Younger Dryas. So they found the gold as well. And, um, so yeah, it's just another point to the fact that Plato was probably not just inventing things out of thin air. He was probably, um, well, people were aware of this like rare gold. So yeah, how could he know? I've just summarized it there myself. Um, there was in fact an island in front of the Straits that sank underwater. Could that be the idea of the origin story? Has the story been expanded and developed over millennia, but the actual origin of it was indeed true? There was historical mud shoals off the coast of Africa and Spain uh, and the Straits, because it's uh, Plato describes how after um, the, the, the deluge occurs, it wasn't quite how the Disney movie put it, it wasn't like a huge wave and then everything, everything was underwater. Um, it kind of aligns with what we were saying earlier with Mark's thing, that it happened, that the actual sea rising level happened over time, that there was an event and probably a huge tsunami and things got flooded and retracted and then a time period of it then being coming inhabitable and people couldn't go back to what was destroyed because it was slowly indeed rising and that there was mud shoals everywhere and you couldn't, you couldn't sail there. This is what Plato says. He said it was, it was unsailable for a, a huge period of time because all the mud had been up earth and you can see there's evidence uh, that the, especially like the Canary Islands and the west coast of Africa was absolutely wrecked. The, I think it's the underside of Tenerife. When you look at it underwater, it's been smacked and the underside of it has been pushed out for miles. This thing was absolutely battered by something in the past. 
again, in the area that Plato made up, right? The Azores lies on the trifold of tectonic plates that show evidence of immersion and immersion. 10 points to Gryffindor, thank you. Um, the Younger Dryas Comet Theory, it supports the timeline. And again, if Plato was going to invent a story, what are the chances that he happened to place that story? Or even if Plato didn't invent it, but if he heard it, what are the chances that he heard a story or read a story in a manuscript that just happened to align scientifically with what we're finding out today? I find that so implausible that he made it up that it's, you know, it's shifting me over there. So what can we rule out from the story? Because there, so there is something in Plato's story that we, skeptics and, and followers, we can all agree on. Um, the description of the island being bigger than Libya and Asia, or what they think would be Asia Minor. Now, they say that it was, um, yeah, absolutely huge. Now, we, we don't have evidence for a whole lost continent um, of the size that they are describing. So we can all agree that that part of the story, but it doesn't mean that, that there isn't truth to the original story. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't look or we shouldn't, it, just because one thing doesn't align, you don't throw all, all the other evidence out. Um, but it's an interesting thing to talk about, and it, and it is a bit of a sticking point because there simply just isn't, at the moment, we, we can't find any evidence for this huge continent. So either it was a gross exaggeration, somebody in the relaying of the story, whether it was the Egyptians or whether it was Solon or whether it was Plato himself, grossly exaggerated the size of this island um, for their own purposes, for their own whatever. They wanted it to sound more impressive. And I mean, yeah, I also think that it's not completely out of the range of, of, of truth that what, somebody would lie about the size of something to impress someone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or it's a mistranslation of the word island, because remember, Solon, was translating the words so that they would, he was taking the Egyptian words and finding, researching the meaning, and then he was flipping them into Greek words so that he could kind of relay it more accurately to like his audience. Maybe that's what happened as well. Um, Atlantis is referenced in some parts of the text. It's referenced as an island. Sometimes it's referenced as a, like a capital city on the island. And sometimes it's referenced as the whole kingdom. So there, it's, it's not universally referenced the same. And there could be the possibility that an island, the word island has been translated so many times that, the, that it maybe meant something else, as well as an island. Maybe it was like a, you know, lots of islands, or a, a peninsula, or, or, you know, something else. Um, yeah, referring to the size of the island. That, that's another thing. I, so personally, I think what the closest thing that like, fits right with me is that he was describing the, uh, potentially the size of the empire itself and not the capital island. Like we say, uh, the size of Polynesia, we're not talking about the actual land mass of every single island. We're talking about the, on, the, on the globe, what is the size of it. And this is the size of what is described in the text of when they're saying that they, the, this Atlantean civilization, um, they were a big deal, they, they, could, they could sail around, they, they, they had a military, and that they had taken over parts of Spain and North Africa, right, right all the way up to Egypt, it says in the text. And then again, when they're talking about that you can pop over to the other island and just hop, skip, and a jump over to America. So this, when you look at it like this, this is the size of something bigger than Libya and Asia Minor put together. OK, so besides Plato, is there any evidence to the truth in the story? The younger Dryas photo that was taken at the time um, <laughs> this is what it could have looked like. Obviously, yeah, I'm not going to even attempt to go into any of the science of uh, the younger Dryas, but from what I can gather, it was pretty wild and completely aligns uh, with the story of, of Atlantis in terms of its destructive capabilities, the fact that things could be wiped out to a point. We were losing megafauna, everything was going under the water. It was, um, I mean, you know what, it fits, the shoe fits. Again, more um, CCTV of what was going on. Um, this is my very accurate AI graph of the water rising after the Younger Dryas. I thought, let's just test it. Let's see what AI does if I ask for an accurate graph of the water rising. And, um, and it gave me this, which I can only assume is in original Atlantean dialect here with the Elsae, Elsae. There we go. 
Um, and then everything was like set on fire. It was like, it was a really crap time, <laughs> to be honest. Um, photo credit, Mark Young. Because um, originally, when you like Google Younger Dryas, it had a much smaller impact zone. Um, but now, as more research is coming out and we're getting more things out of the gate and more things are genuinely being um, studied, the, the impact zone is like getting wider and wider and wider. And one of the, um, one of the reasons why we don't see impact sites is because purely they, they've not yet studied it. So I'm imagining maybe in the next 10, 20 years, as more of this stuff gets really deeply looked into, we're going to get a much clearer picture of just how wild this thing was. And, uh, and yeah, so at the moment, I mean, we're middle of the Atlantic, we're just in there. We're just in the impact zone. Okay, maps with weird stuff in them. Now, this is, this is really cool. So you might know, probably aware of the, the Perry Reese map, which I really embarrassingly, when I first spoke about it on my YouTube channel, I called it the Perry Perry map, which is, um, that's like a spicy food, I think, but okay. <laughs> Perry Perry chicken is, is big in, in the UK. So um, it's, it's a really old source map, and it's really cool. Uh, 1513 by a Turkish cartographer. Now, only a third of the map is surviving. It's like it's already like its own Hollywood movie. I'm like, where are the other two pieces of the map? I've got to find them. Luke, where are you? OK. Um, and it's compiled from lots of other ancient source maps, which is why it's super interesting. Um, now, one of the reasons why it's famous, Graham put it on um, Ancient Apocalypse, about potentially having Antarctica along the bottom. Now, at first I was like, oh my god, amazing, well, that, that would be great, that, that's, you know. But when I really uh, looked into it, I found a guy that was um, really studying the Perry map, and I actually don't think it shows uh, Antarctica, um, because Antarctica wasn't discovered until 1820, and apparently um, there, there, is a, there is a decent argument that it could look like Antarctica. The, I think it was, was it the US? Someone like, did an aerial scan, and they officially came back saying, like, Actually, yeah, like what they've drawn on the map and what, what the actual uh, land mass of Antarctica, it, it does sort of align, actually. There's a, there is an argument for that. However, there's something cooler, I think, in the Perry Reese map. Um, right, well, we'll do a quick one-on-one -on -one about maps, because I didn't know anything about maps until I looked into this, and then when you know about maps, you can like, see what I'm seeing. So you got like three kinds of maps, azimuthal, which like you know, the, the, world, the world logo there that we have on the, whatever that is, is it UN? No, the National World Logo, there it is. And um, azimuthal is where you have um, a point in the center of the map, and it's very, very precise. And then as it goes out, it kind of warps and bends and goes a bit like it's on acid. And then you've got um, a Makeda projection, which is like a globe, and you put it into a cylinder. And this is what we're most used to looking at when you have like a nice painting of the world, um, or like Google Maps on the flat. That's, what, that's the Makeda projection. And then you also have Porterland, which is like cool old pirate maps that have like... Um, um, the, like rose, rose compasses in, and they just they look they look all cool. Um, so the Makeda map, it it warps things in a different way to the Azimuthal. So you, here you can see at the equator, it's 3,300 kilometers, uh, and at the top, it's the same amount of distance. It just looks like a lot harder to do at the top than at the bottom. And then this is an Azimuthal map with a Makeda map superimposed on top of it. And as you can see, the azimuthal map starts to warp. Um, depending on where you place the center of, um, of your azimuthal, it will warp in a different way. But you can start to see what it's doing, which personally is what I think is happening on the Perry Reese map, that maybe one of the ancient source maps um, was uh, in azimuthal design. And it's starting to do, to do that, because it is rising at the exact point um, that it does in the Perry Reese, where it's super accurate to like the butt end of uh, South America, and then it starts to rise on both the north and the tail. As you get there, you go. So you can see, like um, on the right, the the yellow is the actual um, Google Maps uh, North American uh, landline, and you can see that it's rising in exactly the same way on the Azimuthal and below. But there's something even cooler, like encoded in in the map. So there's this dude, and he he um, he, he digitized the Perry Reese, and he's been playing with it in CAD models, and like uh, playing, like, really looking at it in the dimensions in a way that I couldn't do because I can't do maths. But he found out that the two scale bars are not the same size. So the north one measures 73.7 millimeters, and the south one 70.6 millimeters. There's like a five percent difference between the scales. Now, when the map is put into a Makeda projection, like a 3D globe, like the global, like the, the Google Maps, the scale bars match. 
which is something incredible to, to, to in the real world, um, their, repl their, their, their representation becomes more and more accurate. So in the real world, the north scale measures 1,956 kilometers, and the south is 1,965. That's a difference of only 0.4%. So when you pull it into the real world, they were accurately projecting, um, which on something of this scale, on these source maps at 1513, that's incredible. And the only way that you can do that um, is to have accurate longitude. So this is why it's a bit of a head scratcher. And this guy was like, Okay, this is, this is really weird and really exciting. The ancient source maps seem to be showing that they could, they could do a very advanced cartography um, with, a, with a, like a Makeda projection. And, and the reason why that's weird is because you could only get accurate longitude after the invention of the clock, of accurately mapping time. So we had longitude, like the Greeks had it, but they had a very basic version of it. It, it was no way able to do their little party trick of being able to accurately project in a real 3D space. So this is weird. This is like, okay, well, how, if we had the clock here and it's showing up on even older source maps to so the 1500s, it points to the idea that those ancient seafarers had a way of mapping time um, before we sort of reinvented it again. Now, the center point, the azimuthal, has to have like a center point where it focuses on. And this guy was like, well, there's a theory that the center point of the Perry Reese map could be Giza, Egypt, which is like, oh, wow, the movie continues. So if this is correct, it would, yeah, it would point out that the map neighbors were, were able to accurately project out using um, advanced longitude. Ad accurate longitude. So the dude who made the cab map, he measured the longitude, or he measured, like, he did, like, a whole bunch of maths that, like, lost me. I, I watched this video, like, five times, being like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And then I, I didn't really get it, but I got the gist of what he was saying. <laughs> that, uh, that basically, he measured two points on the, on the map, and they were accurate to with the percent when you were projecting it out. And the distance on the map, when you put the Perry Reese into, on, you know, on the globe, um, the, between Cairo and the North Pole, it's exactly the same as the North Pole and the Rose Compass that's on the surviving Rose Compass that's on the map, and it's the same distance between the Rose Compass to Cairo. It's creating like a weird pie thing. Here it is in big. Um, and yes, so if you center the Perry Reese map uh, on, Cairo, on Giza in Cairo, um, the, the, the point of the map which really uh, lines up, which is the west coast of Africa and the very point of, of North America, um, they align in the exact same way that, that it should do. It's, it's turning up like super correct. And then the map is starting to warp in the exactly the right places. So personally, I think that this isn't a map of Antarctica on the bottom, but it's almost just as cool because it's showing real evidence that seafarers before we uh, allow seafarers to be seafarers, um, that there was something going on in ancient source maps. Um, and I wish we had the other two, because imagine, you know, who knows what's on the other like two percent, two thirds of this map. Okay, now we're getting on to out of place artifacts, which uh, just blows my mind. Um, all over the world, you get these um, ancient, like super old artifacts or structures, and they, they have like a, a vibe to them, like an aesthetic, you know? Um, if Ikea was gonna do like megalithic aesthetic, um, this would be it. So you've got ancient Japan and ancient Egypt and um, some structures in like uh, South, Central America, and they, they, they sort of like share the same, it was, almost, it was almost like the same dude designed them. Or woman, let's not be sexist. Right, um, we've got the Assyrian. Um, the, the top is, again, also ancient Japan. Um, you've got this really weird bowl that is, when you first look at it, you don't, you're not that impressed because you're like, oh, it's just a, like bent pottery, I could make that. And then you realize that it's carved out of stone, out of really hard, complicated stone, and that the, the tech, we don't know how, how the hell these things were made. And what's even more crazy is that the, the bottom one was from my first trip to Egypt. You just walk in the Cairo Museum, everyone's running to like the main things you look at in the museum, the, the big statues. No one's looking at this little like dusty old cabinet that almost hasn't been opened in like 50 years. And this stuff's just living in there with no one looking at it until us now. Um, and I think that this is where a lot of like the secret source is. Um, and Ben's doing a fantastic job in um, pioneering the effort to, to really get this stuff scanned and looked at and like studied in a deeper way. Um, you've got Saqqara, you've got the schist disc, be very careful how you say that, um, it comes out wrong. Um, 
Karnak is a really cool temple because it's, it's a complete onion of like different time periods. And you've got stuff that's like super precise, uh, granite cut, megalithic-y stuff. And then you right down to like new, new things. It's almost, it's like an onion. Um, and interesting, when I went to uh, Edfu, remember I said that there was this like text that sort of said the Atlantis story without mentioning the word Atlantis? Weirdly, the, the guide that was there, and I was really grilling him about it. I was like, Do you think it's Atlantis? Is there anything you can tell me that it could be Atlantis? And he was like, well, actually, the, the story, like the, the traditional story, is that the pyramid shape and the um, obelisk shape came from, in the Egyptian culture, they say that the pyramid shape and the obelisk came from that island of the gods um, that disappeared, and that they, they rebirthed the civilization um, in the the dynasties that we acknowledge is the 2.0. But it's weird that he said that. It was weird that he mentioned that the pyramid shape and the obelisk shape came from the time before, um, because they are the ones that really fit in with this weird, like, smooth, ergonomic, almost like minimalistic, futuristic. That's what I'm going to call uh, this style. Um, again, ancient Japan, really cool. I did a lot of research on this, and I think I discovered what it is. I think it's the bunker from Lost, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> That's what's going on there. Um, I'll put it up for peer review, but yeah, okay. Uh, and then there's like the idea that like the older something is, it tends to follow the, the idea, oh, I'm losing my mic, that uh, the older the structures are, the bigger and more megalithic it is. Like it's, it's almost more impressive the older you get. And then when you, when you really analyze the timeline of particularly Egypt, you see this weird decline where they start using smaller stones and smaller stones and they're beautiful and amazing and uh, some of my favorite temples are like the new kingdom temples but they're impressive in a very different way they're just absolutely covered from floor to ceiling in hieroglyphs and reliefs and stories whereas so there's some older stuff that's just completely bare and barren and its beauty and its awe comes in just the sheer size of it like this, which is uh, the pregnant lady of Lebanon, because of course there's nothing bigger than a pregnant lady. So, um, and these these pots, these really weird pots. That again, if you go to Ben's channel, he's he's all over the pots. Um, but there are thousands of them, and they're only found again at the very very early beginnings of the dynasties. And um, what impressive that they are not pottery. Repeat, they are not pottery. These things are carved somehow. Um, and they come in all different shapes and sizes, but they are all like equally as perfect and symmetrical and beautiful. And what's really confusing is that they're put in a in a in like a cabinet with um with other bits of pottery and things from the time. Um other sort of vases and things which are like nowhere near. It's very clear um, you know, which one is sober and which one's drunk, if you know what I mean. And how you, um, how you, how they date them, like, a, like literally officially how they date them, um, is by any either the grave they were found in, which personally I don't think dates something. That's just like the earliest time that it was buried. Um, doesn't say when it was made, and or inscriptions on them. So there are these inscriptions. So here, here we are. This is the dude um, that apparently made this pot, and. And it, it almost becomes laughable when you're going around Egypt and you, you're looking at the inscriptions that the museum gets the dating of the object from. And I'm like, something doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem, someone's telling me that the, the dude who did that uh, didn't make the whole thing. And, and really the only answer to the argument that I get is like, well, it, it was a different people made them, different people um, you know, tagged the names on them. And, and that was just what they did. And I'm like, really, that, that's the highest skill that you could get on carving your name I mean, imagine making like a whole car and then just like getting your two-year-old to like scribble your number plate on. You'd be like, no. You're... So yeah, just briefly touching on, on Ben's work. Recently, they were able to like scan um, a, a, a vase that was in private collection. So uh, really cool ability. And the stuff that the numbers that are coming, I had a guy come up to me yesterday talking about the numbers that are encoded and the sacred geometry and the precision work that are coming out of these objects out of the early like second dynasty tombs. It's, it's just, it's unbelievable. So yeah, there was Ben doing his thing. Um, and these really are like an actual smoking gun because there's, at the moment there's really nothing that can, can answer what's going on. All we know is that we have blaringly obvious um, evidence that we do not know what the hell was going on back then. Oh, and these are the lids. This is great. So um, there, there are the, uh, 
There's the pots, and, um, and these are the lids uh, in the Cairo Museum that the Egyptians made to obviously put stuff in. I was like, that's embarrassing, just take them out. You know what I mean? Like, that's not, mm-mm. Um, this one again, pretty cool. It's, it's made of super, super hard rock, and, and you can see that it's like millimeters thin. You can, you can kind of uh, dodge around um, in the cabinet and have a look, and you could, these things are almost like translucent. The stone is so thin, um, yet they were supposedly carved by hand, like crazy. And this guy, look at this. And, and the tag there. Um, this is fun. So this is the oldest statue of, um, that we have of a, of a sitting pharaoh, second dynasty. And this, is, this dude's in, in the Cairo Museum as well. And um, beautifully made, beautifully uh, amazing uh, statue. And I asked, like, oh, cool, so how did you get the date there of, um, how did you get the, the date of 2000? They're like, oh, can you see it's inscribed at the bottom? You can see um, everything about the, the pharaoh. And I'm like, that's the reason we attribute this statue to that pharaoh, is, is that inscription. Um, okay, I was like, is there a possibility? Is there a possibility that this item may be a legacy item and that maybe the Egyptians inherited something, and that perhaps the whole aesthetic of the ancient Egyptians as, as we know them, perhaps they adopted it like in the same way that we'll, we'll see what Kim Kardashian's wearing, and then we'll copy it. I was like, could, could, could it be possible that the Egyptians were like Kim Kardashianing um, from the time before? And uh, Yeah, there we go, work in schist. Um, oh, and that's the, the dodgy plate, dude. Looks like it's melted, it's, it's quite fun. Um, okay, recap. So we've got the Younger Dryas Comet, we're coming into land. Thank you. Um, impact, lining up with the timeline for the Atlantean demise. We've got ancient maps showing use of advanced mapping cartography. Um, you know, they could sail around. Um, we've got artifacts from prehistory showing mind boggling craftsmanship and accuracy not replicated uh, until pretty much now. And even now, we would struggle to make some of these items. Um, matching styles of architecture and symbology from Egypt, Japan, Lebanon, South Africa, Easter Island, Australia, Turkey. It's, it's, it's all looking um, very designed. Um, and emerging proof that we've really, really underestimated pre-6000 BC. Um, I remember at school like really being told that civilization started um, only in, in, in the Middle East, and it was very hardly aligned, you know, almost to the Bible with the 6,000 uh, BC timeline, and nothing could possibly ever come before that. It just simply wasn't possible. And then they're like, oh, no, wait, uh, go back to Turkey. Uh, <clears throat> oh, no, wait, uh, actually, humans have been alive so much longer than we ever perceived that they could be. Um, and even recently, like, I haven't fully looked into it, but just literally this week, I saw an article about um, in ancient India, they found uh, uh, an ancient, uh, potential ancient civilization there that, that goes back to 8,000 BC. And I'm thinking, hey, hold on. Atlantis was only supposed to be like, what, 9,500? So that, that's really not that far away from what we're emerging. And if I was going to place some money, I would say that in the next 10 years, we are going to be finding more and more and more um, of these sites that really make the sort of marry the timeline from this mythical Atlantean age to what we know as like hard fact, I think they're gonna start blurring together. So what might it have looked like? That's what I wanna know because I can, I can see when I'm looking, once you, once you know what you're looking for and you're looking for this sort of like minimalistic, almost futuristic aesthetic and it keeps popping up all over the world in the, the, the oldest stuff, I was like, well, what, what could it have looked like? So I downloaded AI and thought I'd have a go, which was actually, really, really hard <laughs> because um, I realized that AI doesn't know what I'm talking about because AI has no reference for what I'm talking about. So I wrestled for many an hour trying to find um, some visuals, but, but I found some cool stuff, so I wanted to share it. Um, we've, we've got buildings and, and objects. This is heavily inspired by, I, I inserted like the schist disc. There we are. Um, and, and all of the out-of-place objects um, to give what... This, this is also based off um, the ruins of the inside of a pyramid um, in Egypt. And this is potentially, again, we're just really releasing our imaginations here and being like, okay, I think that the, the, the lost civilization that we could potentially be, be looking for, it would look something like a mixture of all of the artifacts that we find in the ancient sites. Um, 
And it was interesting that AI was, was turning up some things like this, which happened to look a lot like Petra from Jordan, and also um, the Barabar Caves in India. If you don't know what that is, definitely Google the Barabar Caves. They are almost, I think, probably even more impressive than some of the stuff in Egypt. There are these caves that are mathematically inside. They are polished to a surface that is so smooth to the human eye, they become translucent. Um, the camera team that went to shoot the documentary out in, in Barabar, they said they were struggling to film just how smooth and how amazing these polished granite caves um, were because the camera was picking up the stone behind the polished granite. The polished granite was almost like see-through to the camera and they were like looking with their eyes and then looking with the camera and they're like, this looks awful. Like this is not what we want to show people. Um, and it was interesting that um, the, the AI was started to look a bit like the Barabar Caves, and I did not imp Im import a Barabar into this. Um, these, the granite, were, okay, cool. So again, going with the idea that um, the Egyptian, original Egyptian pharaohs of those first dynasties, that maybe they um, got their aesthetic, you're gonna have to get it from somewhere. People always copy, you know what I mean? They always look at someone and start a trend, everyone starts wearing one shoe, like backwards or whatever, and everyone starts to copy it. So. I think this is, a, this is a dude. No, it's not a dude. I mean, it could be a dude, no judgment. But um, this is <laughs> possibly lady dude. Um, again, using that like minimalistic, almost futuristic um, stuff covered in gold. Um, this was, a, yeah, ancient statues, ancient gods. Who were they trying to replicate? Who were, who were they trying to look at? Um, the guy on the left has got like 20 fingers. That's weird. This weird object is an amalgamation that AI took of all of the objects. Um, and I was like, that's weird. I don't know what it is. But then so is the schistus. We're looking at the exact same thing, as confusing as this image is. Um, same, thing, same thing with the schistus. Like, what does it do? It's probably religious. It was probably a very sacred religious box. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was really hard. AI does not like when you try and input tropical plants or foliage or greenery and the sea at the same time. For some reason, it just won't do it and it just looks like a puddle. So here we are. Um, this is, I started putting more like cosmos, cosmology into it and it started getting pretty epic. Now, I have a theory, and this is totally just from my own brain, that a lot of this uh, older megalithic stuff, the reason why it looks so different to anything else in, in later in, in all the other cultures is they, they cover, the latest stuff, they cover with hieroglyphics and, and imagery and um, carvings, and, but all of the old stuff is like completely smooth and pristine and almost boring, like there's literally nothing on them, the pyramid, everything like that. But then we talk about in Plato's Atlantis about how the main temples were plated entirely with gold and oracle. Um, so I was like, cool. So what if maybe that's why? Maybe anything that um, used to be covered in, in gold and silver and oracle. And, and maybe that's why people have um, recycled. We, it's so hard to imagine, um, even in like ancient Egypt, so much of it has been recycled by other cultures and the Romans and the Arabs, and they've literally would take stuff and rip it off and reuse it. And so we see like the bare minimum skeleton of what, what is really there. So I was like, I have a feeling that maybe some of the old stuff once upon a time could have been coated in golds and metals. And that's why it's completely pure because perhaps the gold or the decoration and whatever was, was on the gold and that's just, that's gone or it's uh, rusted. So yes, back in time, maybe these statues and everything were, were looking super shiny. Um, and then it, 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 all this stuff, the aesthetic, it, it leans really well into like Blade Runner. So I started putting like Blade Runner, ancient Atlantis Blade Runner stuff, and I just think it looks awesome. I was like, yes, exactly. Um, and this is what I thought was cool. So if something happens and we, the, the water really does start to subside, and because anything um, that we lost when all of this, the sea levels rose, um, it could still be down there. Like really minimal effort and look at studying has happened um, all along those coastlines and out into the sea. So if it ever did go down, we would probably start to see like stone hinges like rising out of the oceans, and it would, it would be super cool. 
Um, again, here this is looking like Star Wars, which is cool. Um, this I was like, oh my God, what if you were a person, you know, just chilling at home and then you got the younger Dryas deluge coming at you? Um, that's probably what they saw. Um, and then I got a bit cheeky and was like, oh my God, I'm gonna put myself in AI. <laughs> yeah. So this is me, Atlantean princess. Um, that's fun. Oh, now here's, here's my bloopers, because again, AI was like sending me. I was like, circular city, I would like a circular city with mountains, and, um, and it gave me that, and I'm like, what the hell is that? When people walk in, okay, like a, and there we go. Again, really not useful, a, lit a literal circle city, designed, painted by me. Um, and again, this one, I was like, I don't, this is not what I was really looking for, but they were, they were, they were cool anyway, these kind of, also, one thing that AI does not know how to do, it just, when you put anything like, uh, or any reference that is in the past, ancient Egyptian, it will automatically make it look like mashed up and old and ancient. And I'm like, no, I wanna, I wanna see it new. So that's something that AI is yet to be able to understand when you wanna see like as it was. Again, this was super cool, but did, didn't look like the megalithic structures that I'm looking like, it looked like something in India or something, it's beautiful. Um, again, I don't know what this is, but um, this, I was trying to do like golden pyramids, um, but it looks like something out of Minecraft, I don't know what's going on. Um, and this one's cool, this one kind of came up by accident, and I was like, oh my god, I don't even know what I put in, I forgot what I inputted, but um, it's super beautiful, and I was like, this is my movie poster! So I accidentally made my movie poster, um, but looks, now that I look at it, it looks a little bit like Avatar 20, but that's okay. <laughs> Right, thank you. We got to the end. Thank you for that. <laughs>